Good morning. morning. Reading of God's Word today is in Acts 26, 18. To open their eyes and turn them from their darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sin and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So be it. Good morning. If you'll bow with me, we'll start in prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that we are able to come and freely worship you, Lord. Open our eyes, open our ears to to see and to hear all the wonders that you have in store for us, especially as your children, Lord. Lord, help us to not take your word in vain, but to eat and dwell upon the words of Jesus that they may be life for our very soul. Lord, that we may be a witness to others, Lord, that we may live a life that brings you glory and honor. Lord, there's nothing that we can do to obtain salvation. It is so graciously given freely from you. And Lord, help us to not take that for granted, but to work our salvation out with fear and trembling, knowing that if we continue to love you with all of our heart, all our mind, all of our soul, and love others, that we are living like Jesus in this world. Lord, fill us with your love and help us to be united, one in spirit, with a common mission, Lord, of of facing any storm that comes our way so that we can present the gospel message to others and bring glory to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Sherry's not here today because we've got a little one over there with a fever. Seems like there's one thing after another, but that's nothing like what Paul faced. I hope you read (laughs) Acts 24 through 28. What a crazy story. Every time I read it, I just get excited more and more. Luke is a very good storyteller. He does great details. And who would have ever thought that this was how the book of Acts was going to to wind up? But let me remind you, the book of Acts didn't come to an ending. The book of Acts continues on today. We are the church, just like the first church. And God has intended for His Holy Spirit to have wonderful acts through us that take the gospel message to whoever we encounter. I pray that you face whatever storm comes your way, that you, that you fight this race with everything that you have as far as the Spirit dwelling in you, that you understand that the, what's uh, mapped out before you, and that you live a life that brings glory and honor to God. Twenty-five or more years have passed since the events of Jesus, but the things are still very familiar with the people there, so remember that at this time. The gospel message has spread all over the the known world. Paul and Barnabas and his companions have done three missionary journeys so far. And you could call this Paul's fourth missionary journey if you wanted to do so. The religious leaders are still fighting against Jesus Christ, even though there are so many proofs that, that Jesus is the Messiah, the chosen one. And the world is still living just the same as it always seems to, living for itself, for the kings and kingdoms, and the king of this world, whether you think you do or not. God created you in His image to bring Him glory and honor, to worship with Him, to thank Him, to abide in Him, and then we sinned against Him. But because of His wonderful, amazing grace... He sent His one and only Son to die for us that we may be brought back into a right relationship with Jesus Christ. I hope you ponder that, that you dwell on that, that you read God's Word and study God's Word, that you don't waste your life living for the world, but you spend your life living for Jesus, even if you have to face storms, even if the world says that you're crazy, whatever it might be, that you live a life of worth. So I've got to ask you a question. What is the gospel? Because as you see, as we read these different letters that Paul wrote and Peter wrote and James wrote and the author of Hebrews wrote and so forth, and as you read the book of Acts, you see that the church is constantly being bombarded with false gospels. 
that I can live a life however I want to. I'm saved, and so I've got my fire insurance. That I can sin if I want to because I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. That, hey, if I'm prospering, that's because God is smiling and giving me His grace. That's why I'm not suffering. These aren't biblical things. These are false gospels. Jesus said plainly, and that's why I put this poster right here to remind me every day, that you must deny yourself the things that you want to live for, everything else, and put God first in your life. That doesn't mean that He's going to send you to a foreign mission field necessarily or anything else. It just means that you realize that it's not your will that's to be done, but God's will, that you were bought with a price, that you were created in God's image, that you belong to Him so that you search out the fellowship that you have with God by indwelling with His Spirit, by reading His Word, by being in communion and fellowship with one another. Now, what is the true gospel? What does it mean to you? And how is it affecting your life? Because if this gospel message means anything to you, it has to be permeating your life. Or maybe, maybe it just doesn't mean that much to you. Remember, Jesus said many on that day will cry out and say, Lord, Lord. But He will say, Depart from me, I do not know you. The church was constantly fighting battles from within and without, and we see that all the way through. But let's dig in a little bit and cover some of these chapters. Acts chapter 24. Basically, it's Paul's trial or his witness, his testimony to Felix. You realize that, right? I mean, God put him in this place so that he could witness to kings. He would even make his appeal to Caesar, who would reject the, his appeal by all means. He would be martyred for it, and the persecution that would come on the Christian church would be like nothing we've ever seen since. But we are called to spread the gospel message, and who would have thought that it would have come this way? In Acts chapter 24, we started our reading this way. Acts 24, verse 1. Five days later, the high priest Ananias went to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tert Tertullus. And they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. When Paul was called in, Tertullus presented his case before Felix. We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you, and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation. Everywhere and in every way, most excellent Fe Felix, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude. But in order not to... To weary you further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect and even tried to des desecrate the temple, so we seized him. They had more confidence in kings of this world. They had more confidence in their government. And the peace that they had, even in Israel, where they were a conquered nation, where Caesar was proclaimed to be God, not God Almighty, because things were going good for them. Sounds a lot like the United States and the blessing that we feel like God is putting on us so we can live however we want to and we can accumulate as many things as we have, which is self-centered rather than selfless as the gospel preaches. And if you notice, they called him a ringleader of the Nazarene sect. Here's a new Greek word for you. It's hierosis. It looks like a word that we know as heresy. And you know, it can be that word, but that's really not the literal meaning of it. It means literally a storming of a city. It also means a choice or choosing. That which something belongs to because of their choice. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it depends on how it's used, whether it's bad or not. In this case, they were using it in a, in a bad way. They were saying that Paul was the ringleader of this Jesus of Nazareth, this sect, this cult, this false gospel. But this, in fact, is the true gospel, the one and only gospel. Go back and read one of the gospels and read Jesus' teachings. Go back and read the Old Testament. Remember, again, when Paul reasons with the Jews and when he preaches to the Gentiles, he uses Old Testament Scripture. We don't have the New Testament at this point. The Old Testament points to Jesus, tells about Jesus. And as you go back and read that, look for how much it talks about Jesus, not just in fulfilled prophecies, but in everything that is there. And then see how God's love is so profound and so amazing and so great for you that it was fulfilled in the life and the words of Jesus so that we can live like Jesus. 
Here's how this word is used some. You find it some in the book of Acts. That's where it's used primarily. In Acts chapter 5, verse 7, Then the high priest and his associates, who were, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. It's sad, you see. I like how Bob always does that. That the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. Sect here is used not necessarily in a good way. In Acts 15, verse 5, Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. See, the Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection, so they surely weren't going to believe in Jesus Christ being raised from the dead. They had no hope. The Pharisees, they wanted to, to get people to still have to do the law. It was Jesus plus, or it wasn't Jesus at all, really. It was just the law. Those are sects, those are cults, those are heresies. And we face many heresies in the church today. But when it's used here in Acts 24, verse 5, we have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect. Here it is, people that are a sect, using it to try to make it look like Paul is teaching heresy. But he is definitely teaching the truth. And what other life do we have so much evidence of, of giving up what they had to live for Jesus no matter what the cost and the, the accomplishments that were made by the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit to spread the gospel message. Just as Jesus said, you don't need to worry about the kings and kingdoms of this world, even Israel, but you will receive power and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And that's where we're seeing this gospel message being spread as we read these final chapters of Acts. In Acts chapter 26, the word is used again. They have known me for a long time and can testify, this is verse 5, if they are willing that I conform to the strictest sect of their religion, living as a Pharisee. And now it has become my hope in what God has promised our ancestors that I am on trial today. Paul's not on trial because of him belonging to a sect. He is on trial because of his hope. Do you live out the hope that you have? Because if you have the hope that you say that you have, it should profoundly impact you and change you like no other. Because you know that this life is momentary, that it means nothing in comparison to eternity. In Acts 28, verse 22 but we want to hear what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking about this sect. This is when Paul has finally come to Rome, and the Jews there want to hear about this because everybody's talking about Christians, about the way, about Jesus Christ. Could this be true, or do we want to mock? Whatever the reasons are, they wanted to hear about it because we had faithful disciples, not just the twelve, not Paul included, but so many spreading the gospel message, including lay people. Peter also talks about the, this word. In 2 Peter 2, verse 1, he says, But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. When Jesus says that in Matthew about those who don't know Him, He says, Lord, Lord, we did mighty miracles in Your name. There's nothing there about heresy or anything. That's the sad part. This, this, to me, appears to be people who really did works by the power of the Holy Spirit, by whatever power, but they didn't know Jesus. They did it for themselves, for their own glory, for their own insight. They didn't humbly bow down before the king of kings and say your will be done not mine that's not even talking about the people that come in and affect the church with false doctrines and we're not talking about the differences that we have in scripture or anything we're talking more than anything about that you need jesus plus or that you can keep on living your life that's a problem that the corinthian church had as though you had it before that you can be a part of the world and still be a christian but Scripture clearly teaches differently. So there's a saying, you only live once. What does that mean to you? 
I mean, to the world, it means, hey, you only live once, so we might as well do everything that we can possibly do for ourselves. Oh, we might be good people. We might, along the way, uh, help others. We might be kind. We might say that good people are good people and bad people are bad people, and you know, bad people are the ones that go to hell. But the measuring rod is Jesus. And that's why He had to die for us, because He is the only one righteous. None are righteous, no, not one. But by God's amazing grace, you can have eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So I ask you, if you only live once, how should you live? Can you see that tack I put on the wall? Can you see it? Look at it in comparison to this wall. If this is your life, this wall is not eternity. This building is not eternity. This city is not eternity. This state is not eternity. This world is not eternity. You cannot compare your life to eternity. It cannot be done. And Jesus came to redeem you back to God, to purchase your life. You only live once. James wrote it this way. <clears throat> he said, Come now. This is James chapter 4, verse 13. You say today or tomorrow we'll go, go to this or that city. Spend a year there. Carry on business. Make a profit. You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? Your life is a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord is willing, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your proud intentions. All such boasting is evil. Anyone who knows the right thing to do yet fails to do it is guilty of sin. Jesus said, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after me. It is tough. It is hard. It takes every day bowing down before the King of Kings, thanking God, asking Him to fill you with His Spirit, reading His Word, contemplating on it, meditating it, taking it in just as you take in food or oxygen, drinking the living water of Jesus, because all who are thirsty He will forever quench so that you can live a life like Paul. That no matter what the circumstance is, he praised God, he was thankful to God, he spread the gospel message to others. Acts 24, verse 14 to 16. However, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way. That's what people of that day understood, that Christians lived differently. That believers followed a certain way, that they worshiped God, they lived a different life. And as Peter says, and John says, the world might hate you. Jesus said it. But that's okay. They hated Him. And if you're persecuted for it, it doesn't matter. Your life is nothing but a vapor. So live your life to bring God glory and honor because you only have one life to live. You only have one life to make an impact to those around you, to your children, to your grandchildren, to your friends, to even your enemies. <clears throat> However, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way which they call a sect. I believe everything that is in accordance with the law and that is, that is written in the prophets. And I have the same hope in God all these men themselves have, that there will be resurrection of, the, of both the righteous and the wicked. But here's the difference. The Pharisees have that hope of the re resurrection. The Sadducees don't, but they're trying to get it by adhering to the law, and they're far from doing it. I mean, persecuting and killing people. But they think their righteous acts will do it. When it's a giving up myself and taking on the righteousness of Jesus because my righteousness is as filthy rags. Verse 16, So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. I live my life to glorify God by the power of the Spirit, by His Word and the Spirit conforming me. Acts 24, 22, Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. He was familiar with the way of the Christians. The message 
had even got to Rome. We'll get to that later because the Jews deny that, that they've heard anything about what's going on with Paul. But the gospel message has spread all over the world. Lives are being changed. People are living differently than they did before. And it's costing them something. But only Felix could decide for himself whether he would become a believer or not. The irony here, if you don't understand it, that his wife was the daughter of King Agrippa I. You know who that was? That's the one that put the sword through um, James. That was his daughter. She knows about Christianity. And as, as Paul talked, Paul, verse 25, verse, verse 26, as Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Righteousness. The righteous living that we need to have. And it requires self-control because it takes me off the throne and puts Jesus on the throne. And there is a judgment to come. Every, not every word and action, but every thought even. Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. The Holy Spirit was talking to him, but he didn't want to respond because he was rich in this world. And it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And you can't serve both God and money. And the love of money is the root of all evil, isn't it? That's enough, you may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. At that love of money, that power that we have, the things that we want, the things of the flesh which are contrary to the things of the Spirit. So we need to be literally drunk off the Spirit so that we're crazy about Jesus so that we love Him with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our strength, and all of our mind. So He sent for Him frequently and talked with Him. Frequently. But we have no evidence here whatsoever that there was a conversion. Paul remained in prison for two years. I entitled this message, Smooth Sailing. This is not smooth sailing, guys. Two years. What could God be doing to have him in there for two years? And we don't know what all was happening. Luke doesn't record it. He literally ran out of scroll. <laughs> but I guarantee you, Paul was telling everyone that he encountered about Jesus. We ha already have these where he talks about where the guard um, was changed, the prisoners were changed, everything else, the lives around there. He was continually telling everyone about the good news of Jesus Christ, even in rough waters. Acts 25, Paul's trial or his witness or his testimony to Festus. Festus wanted to please the Jewish leaders, so he was going to release Paul to go back to Jerusalem and hold trial, where certainly the Pharisees would murder him, if God allowed it, of course. King Agrippa arrives. He is the son of King Herod Agrippa I. And they discuss Paul. Festus told Agrippa about Paul, and he says this in Acts 25, verse 18 and 19. When his accusers got up to speak, they did not charge him with any crimes I had expected. Instead, they had some points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a dead man named Jesus, who Paul claimed was alive. <laughs> Here Festus doesn't know it, but he's talking to King Agrippa, and they're talking about Jesus. Could he be alive or not? God used Satan to take him to the cross, which seemed like the ultimate victory, or the ultimate defeat, and God used it for the ultimate victory. That Jesus willingly laid down his life to save his friends. Verse 22 of chapter 25, Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear this man myself. Who would have ever thought Paul would be te teaching and telling them about righteousness, self-control, and coming judgment, and the hope that he has in Jesus Christ, who's the Son of God, who was slain for the forgiveness of our sins and raised to life so that we would have hope and we would live for that hope. <clears throat> Acts 26, Paul's defense, or you might call it an apology, which doesn't mean what we think apology is, or apologetics, it's what he stands on. And you need to study God's Word so you know the truth, so you know that. But you don't have to know every detail to be a witness for God. Some of the best testimonies I've ever heard come from little children. They know that Jesus loves them and died for them and rose again, and they have a hope that He will return for them and they will spend forever in heaven. What a testimony. 
The Spirit is what calls people to repentance and they have to answer or not. You're called to live a life and tell them about the hope that you have. Yes, study God's Word. Be trained so you can rightly divide the Word of truth. But don't forget to be a witness. The chance comes up all the time to tell people about the hope you have. Don't dismiss it. Boldly tell them about the hope that you have in Jesus. John 20, there's a you know, doubting Thomas there. And he wasn't there when Jesus first appeared. So Jesus came back and appeared again. He said, put your finger, this is verse 27 of John 20. Put your finger here. See my hands, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Is Jesus your Lord? Is he God in your life? Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Faith in Jesus Christ is all that matters. And if that's the hope that you have, you can quote John 3.16, I'm sure. But study God's Word so that you can rightly handle it. The more that you read God's Word, the more that the Holy Spirit will reveal it and tell you more and more about it as the times come so that you will have the words to say, that you'll have the apology that you need, the witness that you need. You are a light in a world that is full of darkness is your light shining. Agrippa was very familiar with the story of Jesus also and, that, and why Paul was on trial in Acts 26, verses 6 through 8. And now it is because of my hope and what God has promised our ancestors that I am on trial today. This is the promise our 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. They're trying to do it by their service but not putting Jesus into the equation. King Agrippa, it is because of this hope that these Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? His hope based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 18 says, I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. These are words that Jesus gave to Paul on the road to Damascus. To open their eyes. Have your, has your blindness been healed? To turn them from darkness to light. Are you, have you come out of the darkness? Altogether, totally out, that there's no darkness there whatsoever because the light has overcome it. And are you shining your light that Christ is shining on you? And have you released the power of Satan in your life and given it to God? Because if the power of God is moving through you, there is no telling what the story you write will be. So then King Agrippa, verse 29, I was, I mean, verse 19, I was not obedient to the vision from heaven. First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and on, uh, in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles, I preached that they should repent, turn to God, and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. Is that clear enough? Repent. Change your way of thinking. If you remember when Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was, He said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Deuteronomy says all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your strength. But the problem in that day was I'm not going to give you my strength. I'm not going to give you my life as long as my mind thinks this way. My mind thinks that the things of this world and me being blessed by them means God is blessing me. And so then I don't want to live my life for God. I don't want to take chances. I don't want to rely on daily bread because I want to rely on my bank account or my home or my job or my uh, friends, my relatives, whatever it is. And I won't get on that ship that might be lost at sea because I don't love God enough. And it's not shown in the way that I love others. To change, to repent of the way that you think and turn to God and demonstrate it by the deeds you do that show the proof of your repentance. That's the same thing that John the Baptist said when he started baptizing. <clears throat> Nothing has changed. This is still the mission of the church. This is still the mission of Christians. And the world will think that you are crazy if you live for Jesus. So be it. And they may persecute you. So be it. Nothing will befall you that God does not know about and you won't be harmed in any way that He does not allow. 
What good is it to be rich and build bigger barns and God require your very life today? That's called a fool. Agrippa's reply, Acts 26, 28 to 29, Then Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul's reply, Short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am except for these chains. There was no hostility here, no animosity, no poor, poor, pitiful me that I'm in prison. There was just a desire to tell others about Jesus so that they could be saved. Acts 27. We got the smooth sailing to Rome, right? This is his fourth missionary journey. Don't, don't forget that. Wouldn't we expect now after two years in prison for sure? All right, we're going to have smooth sailing to Rome finally. It's in God's will that I go to Rome. I've been wanting to go to Rome. God knows that. The Holy Spirit is not keeping me from doing it. Looks like I'm going to head there. And we don't have smooth sailing at all. <laughs> but Paul does get to continue to preach to criminals, to guards, to kings, and even to people that he would never expect. Acts 27, verse 10 through 12. Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring loss to ship, ship and cargo and to our lives also. We don't know why Paul said that, if it was from the Spirit or not. Luke doesn't, doesn't give any inference there. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. That only makes sense, guys. The pilot and the owner of the ship. Who's Paul? But his insight told them to do something different than what seemed like they should do. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that they should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbor in Crete, facing both southwest and northwest, a nice place to relax and spend the winter on the beach, soaking up the sun. <clears throat> Verse 13, When a gentle south wind began to blow, they, they saw their opportunity, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete before very long a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by storm and could not head in the wind so we gave way to it and we were driven along. I'll show you a map in a minute and not yet in Logan. And I don't know if you know how the Mediterranean is and I did it the other day backwards because you guys are facing different than I am but the Mediterranean you know sits like this with Israel being here and they're going along and Rome, Italy would come down like this, and there's a little rock kicking on the bottom. Malta's this little bitty island. That past the tip. Past that is all open sea. And the coast, northern coast of Africa, where there are shipwreck after shipwreck after shipwreck from being driven along by those seas for days and days upon end. All hope lost. Nothing but dark and gloom. And your hope is only that you can be satisfied with death because you're suffering so much. <clears throat> As Christians in His church, so many times we're afraid to get in a ship with stormy seas. We don't think God has the ability or the power to take care of us or we don't want to face it or whatever it is. Peter was the only one who stepped out of the boat and walked on water because he fixed his eyes on Jesus. What a missed opportunity for the other 11 that day. Things can't get so bad, can they, that we lose all hope? Acts 27, verse 20, When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and the storm continued ra raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. But if you belong to God, He will never ever forsake you. You don't have to worry about this life because <laughs> it's so insignificant compared to eternity with God rather than eternity apart from God. Verse 21 to 26 of Acts 27. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sell from Crete. Then you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. I wonder if they're listening to him now or not. Last night an angel of the God to whom I belong, whom I belong, my life was bought with a price. 
I belong to God and whom I serve. Because I belong to Him, I serve Him. My life is no longer my own. For me to live is to die, to gain Christ. I consider everything else rubbish or garbage compared to knowing Christ and serving Him. <clears throat> The God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Don't be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as He told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. He didn't know where, but God told him that he was on this voyage to save others and not a soul would be lost. So I think, again, that if I'm afraid to get out of that boat and get onto those waters and walk or, that, or get onto that boat and face the stormy seas, whatever it is that the Spirit's calling me, what other souls could I be affecting along the way that now I don't have the opportunity to affect because the Spirit is calling me on this, but it seems too troubling for me to do it? Or I've got excuses of why I can't do it today. Or whatever the reason is. Missed opportunities when I only have one life to live. <clears throat> the crew had cut the lifeboats loose. They had thrown their cargo of wheat overboard. But they fed on literal bread as they fed on the hope that Paul was telling them in Jesus, the spiritual bread. Acts 27, 33 to 38, just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. What a testimony. I don't know if you've ever got seasick or not, but I've been out on some rough seas and got seasick, and all I wanted to do was get to land. I'd have done whatever it was. I cannot imagine how many days they'd spent in the darkness and the gloom and like I said how you'd be wanting it to end but Paul was preaching the hope of Jesus Christ and the love of God for them through Jesus Christ after he said this he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all then he broke it and began to eat they were all encouraged and ate some food themselves all together there were 276 of us on board when they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. If you didn't notice it, you know Luke is writing, you know he's a companion of Paul, and he says, us here, Luke's on that ship with him. Luke's being trained and seasoned by what he's having to go through by watching Paul. If God loves you, loved you, loves you enough to save you, if you are covered by His grace, then what in the world on this earth can hurt you? You're called to be overcomers. You're called to be a light to this world. You're called to let the power of the Holy Spirit live through you. If only you will trust. If only you will give control. If only you will step out and let God help you weather any storm. Don't try to save yourself. That's what we always try to do. We cannot by our works of righteousness save ourselves. And if you fall back from this, what testimony is that? If Paul would have shrunk down and, and, and been a coward, what kind of testimony would that have been for the people? But he trusted in his God to save him, to do what he said he would do. Acts 28. <clears throat> Where in the world are we? Do you have that map, Logan? Okay. Can you blow it up at all? If you can't, that's okay. So we're going to zoom in, and you won't even see it. Now you'll see it because they got a little arrow pointing to it. Malta is that little island right there. That's it. And today you'll still find St. Paul's Bay there. That little island. How did they hit that little speck out in that big open sea? Except that was God's plan all along. Because you know what? The people on that island may have been missed when Jesus said, I'm going to let, have you take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Paul hadn't visited that island. The people there knew only of the Roman gods and goddesses. But it was God's will 
that Paul preached the gospel even in Malta. Malta is one of the smallest countries there is, but one of the heaviest populations, and they have a Christian community there today because God directed that ship there. It wasn't easy. It was hard. Harder than probably anything that we will ever face. But Paul was faithful and he showed the faithfulness of God to these people who did not know it. God used imprisonment, shipwreck, and even a snake bite, right? To show them how much He loved them and how much that we should trust in Him if you are truly a child of heaven. The Bible is full of these loving stories where all hope seemed to be lost and God says, no, I am your hope. Remember in Genesis, remember um, Joseph and what all happened to him? And in Genesis 50 verse 20, He says to his brothers, you intended to harm me from his own brothers. But God intended it for good and to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. God is in the saving business. If He wants to save you from an eternity in hell, He wants to save you from the king of this world and the enticements that He is giving you to live a worthless life rather than a life of worth while you have the opportunity to do so. <clears throat> Paul is now in Rome in Acts chapter 28, under house arrest, and he's free to preach in chains to the soldiers, the prisoners, the Gentiles, and even the Jews again. Oh, and I forgot to tell you, you know, when that snake bit him, they first thought he was a murderer, right? Because judgments come. They even knew judgment would come on you if you do bad things. But the thing is, again, like I said, we try to think that we're better than we are, but none are righteous, no, not one. And then when that snake fell off and nothing happened to Paul, they wanted to say he was a god. But Paul gave all glory to God. And when they got on that ship, if you didn't read it, the ship had on the front of it the sons of Zeus leading them to Rome. <laughs> the gospel message heading to Rome in a pagan society and everything where the message of hope could be pre preached to this world who believe the things of this world is what made them blessed by their gods. Acts 28 verse 20, For this reason I have asked to see you, he's talking to the Jews, which he typically goes to the synagogues first. It is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. They replied, We have not received any letters from Judea concerning you, and none of your people who have come from there have, has reported or said anything bad about you. Now, we don't know if that's the truth or just what they said, but here he is in Rome, and if you study the history involved here too, after two years, which we're going to see here, his sentence would be overturned regardless. If you read on in Timothy, it says that he has escaped the lion. He escaped Nero before. So Paul probably goes on to preach other places, maybe Spain. We don't know. We know that even Luke abandons him. We read that from Scripture. That all abandoning. We know that he, said, that he writes his final letters. He doesn't have the hope that he's not going to be killed, but he still has the hope of the resurrection when he tells Timothy, don't give up your hope. Live a life of worth and guide this church in Ephesus. <clears throat> None of the people who have come from there had reported or said anything bad about you, but we want to hear what your views are. For we know that everywhere, for we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect, but we still want to hear it. People are talking against Christianity, against the way, against hope. But since we see you and your life, we want you to tell us about it. We'll have to decide what we're going to do with it, but we see you're different. So we want to hear this story about Jesus. Some were convinced, verse 24, by what He said, but others would not believe. The difference is, do you believe? Because if you do, you should live a life that is different, a life of worth. Do you live the gospel? How about in those hard storms of life. Oh, I know the first thing to do is say, why me? It's, it's our nature. Take this from me. But once we do that, why don't we turn to God and say, whatever your will is, Lord. Whatever you've brought, let, allowed this to bring upon. I mean, think back, back about Job. That's, that's a hard one to even contemplate. 
God is using these things to spread the gospel message to save others. And you get to be a part of that. So are you being a part of it or not? Acts 28, 30 to 31, For two whole years Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. That's the word that the NIV news. Unbound. That's the word. The gospel was unbound. Even though he was in chains, the gospel was free to spread across this world. People had to decide or not. But unless Paul would have been faithful and lived a life obedient to the Spirit, a life different to the world, those of the world around, he trusted in God, not trusted in the things of this world, and Paul had those things, then the gospel message would not have spread like it did all the way to Rome, and probably beyond. What a story of Jesus' church. Jesus' church. It's still Jesus' church today. He's still the head. We're still the body. All sown together by the Holy Spirit, given gifts and abilities as the Holy Spirit sees fit to be the body of Christ in this world to be His hands and feet. In 2 Timothy, I told you a little bit about that before. Paul was winding up his letter this way. He said, At my first offense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. But he didn't lose hope. May it not be held against them, is what he says. But the Lord stood at my side. He is the one who gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth, probably talking about Caesar. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to His heavenly kingdom. And this is when Paul knows that he's facing death. To Him be glory forever and ever. Amen. You got your Bibles? Turn to Acts chapter 29. <laughs> I hear some laughing. Yes, there is. And you know what I'm saying. It's being written right here today. What will your story be? I mean, you've had an incredible journey through the book of Acts, through everything else we've read and studied. You should be studying and feeding on God's Word and letting Him write a story with what little bit of life that you have to bring glory and honor to God, that others see you and ask you about the hope that you have. I want us to take communion today because I just felt like we hadn't had it in a while and this would be a good opportunity. All are welcome, but as Paul said, he said, don't take this in an unworthy manner. Is Jesus Christ Lord of your life? We're doing this in remembrance of Him. God, Emmanuel, God dwelling with us. That God would love us so much. When all hope seemed to be lost from Israel, there wasn't a prophet for 400 years. God didn't speak to them. They were in captivity. It seemed like all hope was lost. There was a little baby born, laid in a feeding trough. The glory of God because it was God in the flesh dwelling among His people. To teach them more about Scriptures. To show them the way to live. To not orphan them when He goes back to heaven, but to say, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to comfort you. Something that, that the Old Testament saints could have never even imagined, let alone fathomed that God would literally dwell in us, that we are His temple, that Jesus is the cornerstone and we're to be building upon Jesus Christ and nothing else with our life. So don't let Satan distract you. Don't let him take the life that God has given you and use it in an unworthy manner. Trust in Jesus. Do this in remembrance of Him. On the night that Jesus was going to lay down His life, He said... This bread is my body given for you. 
And he said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant poured out for you because the blood has to be required for the remission of sin. And Jesus said, I will give my blood, my life to save yours. Do you believe this? Will you accept me? In Acts, it says, if anyone believes in their heart and confesses with their mouth, they will be saved. You've got to get that to your heart where it changes the way that you live, that it got past your mind and the way of thinking that you used to live, that you realize that you don't need to live that way anymore. And you don't have the power to do it. You have to deny yourself. You have to rely on the Holy Spirit. And if it means suffering, it means suffering. If it means that your life is basically the same, but, you, but your primary concern is, is spreading the gospel message, whatever it is, live a life that testifies, that witnesses, that even martyrs, the gospel of Jesus Christ and no other gospel. That you love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, and all of your mind. And because of that love, people see it and they see your love for others. They see your good deeds and it glorifies your Father which is in heaven. And then they talk about it even in the king's court when you're not even there. Tell me about Alan and how he lives and this Jesus that he serves. And I didn't just put my name in there. You put your name in there. You have one little bitty life to live. A life purchased by the blood of the Lamb so that you could live for Him. Father, as we take these elements of communion, Lord, I pray your blessing upon them. Lord, there's nothing that this bread's not going to turn into your body or this blood, this, uh, this grape juice turn into blood, but Lord, it's representation of what you did for us. Lord, help us not to take in an unworthy manner. Help us not to think of these things lightly, but to know that you, O oh God, became flesh and dwelt among us and gave up your life to save us. Lord, what do we have other than our lives to give back to you? Help us not to be stiff-necked. Help us not to be disobedient. Help us to be a people, a church, a body that is powered by the Holy Spirit, driven by the Holy Spirit, that faces adversity together, that comforts one another, that, that has joy with each, each other. Lord, I thank you for this body, Lord. I thank you for each and every one here. I pray a blessing upon each and every one as they seek out you, Lord, and make a commitment to be a witness in this world. Lord, help us to make a difference, to light up our world for Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can